So mine is not going to be really a presentation, but more like an introduction. And uh, I'm just going to point out um, a bunch of different approaches and research question that we have. Uh, probably all of us when working with quarries and rock cut sites. Mm, and I think uh, maybe this point could be helpful to start a discussion later on. Uh, and I'm sure that a lot of the questions or uh, the points that I'm going to make are going to be answered or um, you're going to talk about those much more than I can do in this very short introduction. Uh, something I wanted to remind you, if some of you hasn't done it yet, here is the list of the names and the presentation for the video recording. So if you are to present and haven't signed yet, please do it. You can agree or disagree with the recording. Um, because we are still um, missing some people, but not so many. Great. Um, all right. So. I decided to title this small introduction using a quote from uh, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice because I really like this quote. I think it's very funny for people like us who um, work with uh, this kind of site. Uh, and of course, the question what are meant to rock and mountains in Jane Austen's refers to this kind of romantic struggle of humans uh, and humans' life that flows so fast, contrasting uh, the majestic nature of mountains and rocks that seem to be so still and seem not to be changing over time. Um, yet we know that that's not the reality. Um, and we are working on those sides that are actually the result of interaction of human life and uh, geologies. These um, sort of stone scapes that are shaped and carved at time, but the geology and the action of past societies. So in a way, I think as we wrote also in the abstract for this session, we would like to investigate this sort of boundary between human societies and geologies and looking at it at something, as something that is not static but rather dynamic. So where different carvings modify a surface that is more of um, a surface of transi transition of modifications, um, of technological experimentation, of life, of funerary practice, of production. So the first question I think we should uh, try, I don't know, a point we should try to discuss is what are carved sites? What are rock cut sites? What are quarries? How we define that? What are the traces that we use for defining these sites? What are their functions? How we can catalog them, because I think, and I think Anais probably agrees with me, that this is a category of site that has been uh, neglected sometimes, um, because positioned in maybe uh, difficult areas. Um, this, for example, is a picture of the catacombs in Paris that are beautiful, and a part of them is um, a great tourist attraction with a lot of people visiting it every day, but it's also an endangered heritage, a heritage that carries structural problems and then endangers not only itself, but also the city above. So there is also a problem about valorization and preservation of the sites, other than uh, their definition. Um, there is also a problem with working with the sites in a systematic way, uh, while in excavations we have, of course, a horizontal level in archaeology of architecture, we have built heritage. In this case, we are dealing with carved heritage, so something that is in negative, that is uh, produced through subtraction rather than adding material, or both procedures at the same time. So when we work with something like this, we need to revise totally the set of competencies and the set of methodologies that we uh, apply to these kind of uh, features, in which, of course, a new phase of exploitation, a new phase of life bring um, has as a consequence the erasement of the previous one, uh, in which traces are ephemeral, um, and it's up to the archaeologists try to understand which 
uh, marks can be used for reconstructing different moments of the life of these sites that are, of course, um, involved at different levels with society, the materials, and the landscapes. Uh, yeah, this is a, a nice image that I found a few days ago of a patrol of Italian partisans working in the uh, in the quarries of, Car of Carrara, the white marble in Carrara in Italy. Uh, just to say that uh, the sites that we are studying have uh, different lives in a way, or different biographies of different events in their life that can all be recorded and that belong to different types of stories. Um, so how do we record these sites and how we put them in connection to each other? Of course, one tool is definitely cartography. Here is a GIS map that we produced a few years ago with a series of quarries. And the built sites that are connected to these uh, supply sources of raw materials um, and the road network trying to link uh, the supply sources and the distribution of materials over a territory. But of course, cartography can represent a certain scale um, of accuracy, can be used as well um, in a more detailed uh, scale, but presents some problems. Because of course, we are dealing with carved heritage, and cartography, especially in GIS, is rather flat. So we'll uh, reproduce the two dimensions but what we need is something more. Uh, so, of course, geomorphology and aerial photography, of course, is uh, helpful to delineate some geomorphological uh, features that can be used for identifying quarry sites, for example, big accumulation of quarrying waste. Um, and, of course, I think we are all familiar with photogrammetry. And I think that the advent of photogrammetry in the last years uh, radically changed the way that archaeologists dealing with quarries and rock cut sites approach their material because of course we can represent a reality that is articulated, that is carved inside an outcrop that otherwise wouldn't be visible. Here is like a complex of two overlapping churches in Matera in southern Italy uh, and you can see that this wouldn't be visible except this upper part uh, without the 3D representation. But also, photogrammetry should be used with a, uh, with a critical approach, of course. Use and misuse of, misuse of photogrammetry has been very criticized in the theory of digital archaeology. So, therefore, um, photogrammetry in carved sites should also be discussed. Uh, till what point we can use this tool, what is uh, good, what is not good. I think, personally, I think that 3D models without being discussed, without being uh, put in the context and used in a critical way have no uh, meaning. Um, for trying to use 3D models in a, diff in a slight different way, uh, we run um, uh, an experimentation uh, in Umeå, the university I come from, sorry, I, I, <laughs> I, I forgot to say it, in northern Sweden, with the Laboratory of Digital Humanities using 3D models for annotating uh, them. So let's say how you would use the GIS, but in a sort of virtual reality environment. So importing the 3D models, low resolution in uh, Unity, that is a gaming platform, and using the controllers for creating features on the walls. So for example, for marking tool marks, for marking holes and carvings, or architectural elements that could be, oops, sorry, that could be interesting for uh, defining the use and function of uh, the site. And this has been done to try to change the point of view of the observer and not work with a static GIS, but more create some more dynamic tool. And I think that we are all struggling with this kind of um, different documentation system. And then, of course, there is archaeological <laughs> science that in the last few decades has come uh, becoming a big part of the study of rock cut sites and quarries as well especially with quarries, with the characterization of the materials extracted and their distribution to try to understand um, stone exploitation under a more social and m mostly economical point of view. And then there is, of course, the ethnographic record. I think that today we are going to see some uh, example of that uh, that can uh, help us challenging some more uh, cost-effective 
um, hypothesis based more on uh, our, of course, vision of the past. Here, for example, is an example um, uh, of um, a village in northeast India, in Nagaland, uh, where the villagers still um, make standing stones. And this is an image of the quarry where they take their materials. As you can see, that it's not something we are used to see because, of course, the operation of quarry has a ritual meaning. So they don't go systematically or following uh, the geological outcrop, but every um, block that they extract is done with um, a sort of ritual practices. So this is also interesting to see. Um, and then finally, uh, something that is particularly interesting for me, for my um, personal approach to this kind of sites is what is the environmental impact of this kind of site, because in the moment in which humans and stone co-occur, uh, creating these carved sites, there are new ecosystems that are born and that develop. This is another image of the quarries of Carrara. I don't know if you've been there, if you've seen it. It's, the exploitation is huge. The mountain has been completely uh, carved, destroyed. And this is how it looks in the rivers down to the valley. So this white color that you see in the water is marble powder. Marble powder that comes directly from the mountains and goes in the rivers and covers everything, killing uh, all sorts of flora and fauna that is living in these rivers. So of course, there is also like a consequence of um, this kind of exploitation. Of course, in this case, we are talking about industrial large scale, but maybe also um, we can think about this kind of problems for ancient uh, exploitation. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna uh, end with some questions rather than conclusions. So uh, some interesting points that maybe we can discuss later or I would like to address to myself first and then to the others as well. Um, for documenting and studying these sites, there are a lot of different methods that lead to the collection of different data sets. Um, I think we are missing a bit uh, shared vocabularies and normalized uh, systems in a way, because we know that there are very different editions of studies, the French one, the Italian one, the English one, and often the terms are not even the same. So this is probably something that we could discuss. And of course, what is the role of us as archaeologists in promoting and preserving this carved heritage? Uh, we know that a lot of times uh, the study and the preservation and the valorization of this site is done by speleologists, in, um, especially in the case of carved heritage. So what is the role of the archaeologist in this? Uh, and of course, uh, where do we go from here? The aim that we had at the beginning was to try to uh, assemble specialists in this field from all over Europe and even further away, um, and then try to see how we can create some links between what we do and how we work with these sites and uh, try to go somewhere else, try to create a network, and maybe this network could be uh, to be continued. Um, and there is a next um, event uh, that I will give you more information about later on. So in Matera in 2019, you know, it's this carved city in the limestone that is situated in southern Italy. There's going to be a big uh, conference about carved sites uh, next year. We are still organizing it, so we are not sure about <laughs> details, but I'll let you know. Uh, so yeah, this could be also like a a way to see each other again and to continue uh, the dialogue I hope we will start today. So yeah, thank you for your attention.